Chapter 5 The Hidden Civil War One of the issues with discussing the history of secret organizations formed to overthrow the government is that, for obvious reasons, an awful lot is left in shadow. We do not know the precise day or the hour that the Order was founded. We do not know its exact composition or to what precise extent men like Louis Beam or William Pierce were involved in it. Officially, the Order was founded in September of 1983 by Robert Matthews during a convention he attended for Pierce's National Alliance in Arlington. While Beam and Pierce tended to approach the issue of sparking a fascist revolution rather differently, Matthews had deep ties to both men. He was profoundly influenced by Beam's ideas and writing, and was also an obsessive fan of the Turner Diaries. He essentially acted as a bridge between the two sides of the vanguardist movement, tying Beam's Klansmen and Christian identity nuts together with Pierce's neo-Nazis. William Pierce called the Order the Aryan Resistance Movement. Robert Miles called it Bruderschweigen, or the Silent Brotherhood. But to Bob Matthews, and to most of its members, it was simply known as the Order, in direct imitation of the group responsible for organizing the fictional white nationalist insurgency in the Turner Diaries. It originally had just nine men, three members of the National Alliance, four men from the Aryan Nations, and one former Klansman. Matthews devised a six-step strategy for his new terror organization. He would start by recruiting a base of soldiers around the nation and train them at sundry fascist compounds. Once Matthews had trained a core of soldiers, they would begin committing robberies and counterfeiting money. This would fund the purchase of an arsenal, which would allow them to commit more ambitious robberies and raise millions of dollars, which they would then dispense to different fascist groups around the nation. In essence, Bob Matthews had looked out at all the white supremacist compounds around the nation, places like Elohim City, the Aryan Nations, Nehemiah Township, and various posse comitatus communities. He'd felt that these groups had huge potential if only they were connected and funded more effectively. The order was a way to do that. In carrying out this plan, Matthews was both working to fulfill Pierce's dream of a big tent fascist organization and funding Beam's plan to connect these different groups via the early internet. The order's end goal was a white ethnostate in the Pacific Northwest. Here, too, Matthews was following in the footsteps of other fascist thinkers. The Northwest Imperative, as it is now known, first popped up in the 1970s and was initially cheered on by Christian identity pastor and Aryan Nation's leader Richard Butler. In creating the Order, Matthews had synthesized decades of far-right thinking with his love of the Turner Diaries into a serious plan for revolution. And on paper, it all looked kind of like a ridiculous LARP. It was even, you know, inspired by a piece of speculative science fiction. But Matthews quickly turned his plans into action. On October 28, 1983, Bob and several of his men held up an adult bookstore in Spokane, Washington, netting $300. It was an anxious, small-scale crime, perhaps even a laughable one when compared with their ambitions. But Matthews and his crew kept right on robbing. Two months later, they stole $25,000 from a Seattle bank and then $3,600 from a Spokane bank. They robbed a courier after picking up the daily cash receipts from a Shoney's restaurant and made off with $8,000. The order professionalized quickly, and within a matter of months, they'd also started counterfeiting $50 bills. By spring of 1984, Robert Matthews had proved himself to be a competent and dangerous guerrilla leader, and his order was quickly becoming the new big thing in American fascism. Dozens of young militants flocked to join and do their part to further the cause. They flooded in from other far-right groups with names like the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, sundry posse comitatus crews, and assorted KKK chapters. In order to build camaraderie and loyalty, Matthews developed rituals for his warrior elite. I'm going to quote again from Bring the War Home. They took their induction oath on Matthews' farm. They stood in a circle around a white female infant who symbolized the race they sought to protect. They raised their arms in a Hitler salute. I, as a free Aryan man, they recited, hereby swear an unrelenting oath upon the green graves of our sires, upon the children and the wombs of our wives. They swore that they had no fear of death or foe, but had a sacred duty to do whatever is necessary to deliver our people from the Jew and bring the total victory to the Aryan race. They pledged secrecy about all activities to follow. They swore to rescue any of their number taken prisoner. Should an enemy agent hurt you, they promised their silent brothers, I will chase him to the ends of the earth and remove his head from his body. Their oath recognized them as racial warriors, but also transformed them into weapons. 
My brothers, let us be God's battle axe and weapons of war. Let us go forth by ones and twos, by scores and by legions, as true Aryan men, they vowed. We are in a state of war and will not lay down our weapons until we have driven the enemy into the sea and reclaimed the land which was promised to our fathers of old, and through our blood and his will becomes the land of our children to be. In March 1984, the order carried out their first robbery of an armored car. They netted $43,000. They robbed the same armored car again in April and got their biggest score yet, $230,000. Later that month, members of the order also bombed a synagogue in Boise, Idaho. As the summer of 1984 rolled along, Matthews and the other members of his inner circle began to worry that one of their men, Walter West, might talk. Two of Bob's men shot and buried him in the woods on June 1st. A little more than two weeks later, on June 17th, Matthews and three of his men shot and killed Alan Berg, a Jewish radio host and anti-fascist who regularly attacked neo-Nazis on the air. The Berg murder officially raised the order's profile and guaranteed major law enforcement attention. The group's danger was reinforced a month later when they heisted a Brinks truck in Ukiah, California, and made off with a staggering $3.6 million. Now flush with enough cash to wage a revolution, Matthews and his order began buying up guns like they were going out of style. They also purchased a 300-acre plot of land in Missouri and 110 acres in Idaho. Each participant in the robbery got $40,000, but the bulk of the money went to other fascists around the country. Different organizations received grants in $100,000 increments. Matthews tithed 10% of his stolen money to the Aryan nations. Members developed crude code names and acquired fake IDs. Matthews even had silver medallions crafted to act as proof of membership. The nicknames were suitably grandiose and what you'd expect for people who, uh, I don't know, they're, they're all giant nerds. Lone Wolf. Field Marshal, Yosemite Sam. One member was nicknamed Mr. Closet for his love of assaulting gay men. Lewis Beam was codenamed Jolly and Lone Star. Pierce was codenamed Brigham after Mormon leader Brigham Young. Both men had medallions. In nine months, Bob Matthews had turned the dreams and theories of men like Beam and Pierce into a real revolutionary movement. He'd made the Turner Diaries real. New recruits to the order were reportedly handed copies of the book, and for quite a while, law enforcement seemed powerless to do anything to stop them. According to Bring the War Home, even if federal agents and a few journalists were aware of the white power movement, the, main, the mainstream public continued to see most white power violence as the work of errant madmen. The phrase lone wolf, previously used to describe criminals acting alone, was employed increasingly in the 1980s and 1990s to describe white power activists. This played into the movement's aim to prevent anyone from putting together a cohesive account of the group's actions. Their undoing came from an order member and former National Alliance goon named Tom Martinez. Matthews had brought Martinez in to help pass counterfeit bills around his home in Philadelphia. He was caught by the FBI and turned informant to avoid prison. The FBI used his information to trace Matthews to Portland, Oregon, while they engaged him in a short gun battle. Bob was wounded, but managed to flee to Whidbey Island in Washington with several of his most loyal soldiers. The FBI surrounded the house, and eventually all of Matthews' men surrendered. But Robert Matthews refused to give up. Alone, he fought the FBI off for an astonishing 40 hours. The FBI eventually burned the cabin down around Matthews, killing him on December 8, 1984. With their leader dead, the order eventually crumbled, proving, by the way, that Lewis Beam had been wise to emphasize leaderless resistance. After five months of arrests around the country, more than 50 members of the order had been arrested. The FBI recovered a great deal of cash as well, but millions remained unaccounted for. They found some of what that money had bought, though, when they eventually raided the heavily armed Ozarks compound of the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. Law anti-tank rockets and machine guns were found hidden on the property. The CSA was not the only group who had bought rocket launchers with the order's ill-gotten gains. The first trial associated with the order took place in Seattle and included several members of the CSA. They pled guilty on weapons charges and were convicted of racketeering. Next, the U.S. attorney brought a 93-page indictment against 23 members of the order. Robert Miles, Louis Beam, and William Pierce were not indicted. In the months leading up to the trial, members of the order rolled over on their comrades with unusual regularity. By the time the trial rolled around in September of 1985, only 10 of them actually faced trial. This hardened core of loyal racists included David Lane, the man who would years later coin the 14 words that neo-Nazis still use today as a calling card. During the case, prosecutors specifically noted that the Turner Diaries had acted as a blueprint for Bob Matthews. 
according to Blood and Politics. Quote, in an opening statement, a defense attorney acknowledged that his client was a Klan member and an avowed white separatist. Now I say white separatist, he continued, because there is a significant difference in an individual who professes to be a white supremacist as opposed to a white separatist. What was that difference? The white separatist is nothing different than a black nationalist who advocates a separation of races, wants to live only with those members of his race. He advocates the fact that races, when mixed together, cannot survive because of their division and their cultural backgrounds, their upbringing, and their history. The Seattle jury did not buy the spurious distinction between white supremacy and white separatism in 1985, any more than the U.S. Supreme Court was willing to endorse the separate but equal doctrine in 1954. Neither did the jury believe defense efforts to impugn the credibility of Aryans who became prosecution witnesses, nor did jurors accept contentions that the defendants' beliefs were unrelated to the enumerated crimes. After four months at trial, all were found guilty. In death, Bob Matthews and his order became a potent symbol for fascists around the nation. In Raleigh, North Carolina, hundreds of them rallied under banners that said, We love the order. In Idaho, a group called Order 2 set off several bombs in Coeur d'Alene. The date of Matthew's death, December 8th, became Martyr's Day to many neo-Nazis. Some of them started carrying out memorial camping trips near where he had died on Whidbey Island. But still, the order had failed in its goals, and that failure had come at a substantial cost. William Pierce and Lewis Beam had not been indicted or charged as a result of Matthew's activities, but they now found themselves at the center of way, way more FBI attention. In an operation named Clean Sweep, the FBI began seeding white supremacist organizations around the country with undercover operatives. Later in 1985, they stopped an Aryan nation's plot to kill a government informant. Another terrorist associated with that group was stopped after bombing a federal building, several businesses, and a rectory in Coeur d'Alene. In 1986, the feds busted William Potter Gale, founder of the Posse Comitatus, in Nevada. Gale and several allies were convicted of planning to bomb the IRS. Near the end of 1986, the FBI busted eight members of a new group, the Arizona Patriots, before they could carry out their goal of following in Bob Matthews' footsteps. The group had planned to rob banks to finance a domestic insurgency. All around the United States, white supremacists continued to plot and launch attacks. One of these men was Glenn Miller formerly the leader of a group called the White Patriot Party. He'd received at least $75,000 in order money from Bob Matthews. As the FBI busted more and more of these guys, they found more evidence of the order's influence and money. Gradually, they pieced together the story of what had really gone on and came to realize that Matthews' group had sought nothing less than the complete overthrow of the United States government. In mid-1986, Louis Beam, Richard Butler, Robert Miles, and several other ideological leaders of the American fascist movement were finally indicted for their role in the order. The Justice Department charged these men with a number of crimes, including seditious conspiracy to, quote, overthrow, put down, and to destroy by force the government of the United States and form a new Aryan nation. William Pierce, oddly enough, was not indicted. Seditious conspiracy was a crime numerous communists and Puerto Rican nationalists had already been successfully convicted of committing, but no Nazis or white supremacists had ever been convicted of the crime. Despite the order's shocking violence and well-documented goals, this fact was not about to change. The trial convened in February of 1988, and the fascist defense attorney managed to exclude any black people from the jury. The trial was, almost instantly, a shit show, and served more to allow Lewis Beam to preach his views to the nation than to guarantee justice. In his opening statement, he told the jury, quote, The only reason I'm here is because I said what I think. If the Constitution is still alive, I'm innocent. Beam admitted that he had set up computer bulletin boards for different fascist groups around the country, but denied that these boards were used for any illicit communication. He told the jury he'd been changing his daughter's diaper when the purported meeting that created the order had occurred. He dubbed the government's case the Baby Diaper Conspiracy. Beam ended one speech in his defense with an almost word-for-word recitation of something he'd written in Essays of a Klansman about his anger at the protesters he'd supposedly encountered after returning home from Vietnam. As I sat there watching the flag disintegrate, rage and bitterness began to engulf me. The flames consuming the flag changed to flames enveloping an armored personnel carrier in the hobo woods north of Saigon. The cheers of the demonstrators became screams of a 19-year-old soldier over his radio as he burned to death, trapped inside what was fast becoming his coffin. The clapping of hands as the flag fell to the ground became the deafening roar of my M60 machine gun as I literally melted the barrel in an attempt to pin the enemy down long enough for the dying soldier's friends to reach him. Finally, at last, came the laughter of those demonstrators as they spit on the ashes at their feet, blending in my mind with the sobs of grown men as I remembered the armored personnel carrier disappearing in a ball of orange flame. 
After seven weeks of trial, Louis Beam and all of his fellow defendants were found not guilty of seditious conspiracy. They were released, presumably free to return to their lives in the movement. The Justice Department had taken its shot at the intellectual center of white supremacism. They'd failed. And ultimately, their failure came not from law enforcement's unwillingness to prosecute Nazi revolutionaries, but from ordinary white Americans and the sympathy they held for men like Beam, who billed themselves as warriors against communism and patriotic Americans. Beam's racism and his desire to overthrow the government simply weren't seen as all that bad by a jury of his peers. The leaders of the white supremacist movement had gotten off, more or less, scot-free. But the court battle and the months many of them had spent on the lam before being arrested had aged them all horribly. Richard Butler's influence would gradually fade after he returned home to Idaho. Louis Beam continued to be an influential mind within the movement, but he would be more careful and much quieter from now on. The heat brought on by the crackdown forced Beam to retire his beloved inter-clan newsletter and survival alert. The last issue contained an essay by an unknown author, probably Beam. In it, he wrote, quote, the second American Revolution will be a revolution of individuals, a revolution without exact precedent in recorded history, because individuals can accomplish complex acts of resistance without peril or betrayal, or even detection by the most advanced snooping devices. Missions formerly assigned to groups may be undertaken by individuals equipped to fight alone. It would not be long before a young man named Timothy McVeigh would prove these words prophetic.